good day chaps. So today's video is on one of the lesser known series of tanks from the 1930s. It's the A7 series. Only three of these experimental tanks were built and they were used to test a variety of ideas that would go on to influence several vehicles. This video will look at each of them in turn and the tests they took part in as well as the Japanese connection to the British tank design at the time. The British Army had a long period of experimentation in the interwar period. It was the first army in the world to be fully mechanised, which included tanks, transport and artillery, as well as the widespread use of radios in all vehicles, something no other nation had done at that time. And combined with extensive manoeuvre drills, the British designed tanks and doctrine would go on to influence many other nations. Vehicles like the Vickers six-ton tank were some of the best designs in the world at the time and was copied by the Soviet T-26 and the Polish 7TP tanks. Yet despite this, the British would never use that vehicle itself, other than a few for training purposes, while the fleets of their fast light tankettes would go on to be adopted by countries like Italy and Japan. Meanwhile, other ideas were tested, with lumbering monstrosities such as the A1E1 Vickers Independent, a vehicle that lacked any of the tactical flexibility or manoeuvre aspects that had been studied, but looked good for observers, and the idea was copied by the Soviets and the Germans. Although never put into production, the love for micro turrets on tanks remained, with vehicles like the A6 and medium Mark III. The A6 built by Vickers were quite distinctive, having a British penchant for adding little machine gun turrets to absolutely everything. We were quite obsessed with this idea, and you might think it died out in World War II, but even in the Cold War and as far as the uh, Warrior and the FV-432 design stage, the bloody things kept cropping up, despite it never having once proven remotely useful and were about as much use as tits and a nun. The theory was that the machine guns could give the anti-infantry protection, while the main gun would be armed with armour-piercing rounds to deal with tanks. But this was stupid, as it took up a lot of space, made the vehicle larger, and thus weaker overall. Not to mention the crew positions were abysmal. The added size and weight also led to problems with the suspension systems, which tended to fall apart on a regular basis, which isn't really a desirable trait you want on a tank. While Vickers were tinkering on their tanks, the Woolwich Arsenal had been building up their own vehicles. These were the A7E1 and A7E2. This A7 series also bridged the gap between classifications. The British had previously had the heavy, medium and light tanks, with the previous tanks such as the Vickers Medium C replaced by the A7 series which were known as the fast medium tanks and the following vehicles were built under the light cruiser and infantry tank designations and so the A7s were the evolutionary link between them. These vehicles took a different and more sensible approach than the Vickers tank notably in not having pointless little machine guns. This reduced the crew to five, from the seven found on the Vickers tanks, with three in the turret and two in the hull, one driver and one to operate a bow machine gun. In turn, they were able to make the tank lighter, at 14 tonnes, although the armour remained the same at 14 millimetres on the hull and 12 millimetres on the turret, as this was the amount specified. Now, while this might sound terrible, it's comparative to most tanks at the time, being marginally more than the Panzer I and a tad less than the later Panzer II, while the much later Panzer III only had one millimetre more of armour as well, so it's fairly average for the time. The Woolwich team used the suspension ideas, similar to that on the older self-propelled Birch gun, and modified that, with one more return roller and two less road wheels, although the side skirt layouts differed slightly between each model. Each suspension system, while appearing the same, is actually slightly different. The A7E1 used a compensated type bogey, while the A7E2 used an independent trailing bogey type. During some brief gunnery trials between the 6th and 20th of January 1933, it was felt that the compensated type suspension on the A7E1 offered marginally better performance and gun stability than that of the A7E2. However, as only 10 rounds were fired from five different gunners, it was too close to call. The notes also say that despite this, the second suspension was more preferable, 
as it could take a hit and lose a bogey and remain quite operational, while the former could not, and that for all-round practical fighting experience, the independent trailing suspension was more suitable. The engine choices were more limited, and the only available engines were 138 horsepower Armstrong Sydney 8 cylinders. Both vehicles differed in gearboxes, which resulted in both having a different rear end arrangement. These engines would prove highly problematic and break down a lot. Both A7E1 and the A7E2 also were fitted with 3 pounder or 47mm guns. However, each used a slightly different layout. The A7E2 used the gunner mounting from the older medium tank Mark II, while the A7E1 used a new modified layout. Both of these again had pros and cons. The crew preferred the new down-facing breech of the new gun, and other user-friendly tweaks on the E1 hull, but had concerns over the recuperators. On the A7E2, the recuperator is inside of the vehicle, but is weak to machine gun fire hitting the opening and getting inside the turret. While on the A7E1, the recuperator is over the top of the gun and extends out, and is armoured to the sides with a bulletproof shroud, but the front of exposed, and a stray bullet could jam the buffer. However, based on these findings, a new tank evolved, the A7E3. The new tank began on the 19th of December 1933, after a meeting held by the Chief of the Imperial General Staff as part of his research committee, in which they decided to build a new tank to be known as the A7E3. The first consideration laid out was which engine to use, as this is often the starting point in a tank's design. Initially, they wanted the idea of a single engine, for reasons of simplicity and control. However, none were available that were suitable. The notion was raised to use converted aircraft engines, but these were untried and deemed too complicated for the crews to work with. Enter AEC, who were in the process of developing a 240 horsepower engine, made up of their standard diesel bus engines, coupled together but designed in such a way that if one failed, the other could take over the task, albeit with some reduced performance. This appealed to the Department of Munitions, who felt that not only did it offer the power to weight ratio required of 12.5 horsepower per tonne, but used commercially available engines and would lower the overall costs. AEC themselves acquired £100 at the time to continue the work, and on the 23rd of March 1934, it was reported that the work was developing swiftly. On the 24th of May 1934, an order was placed for one experimental A7E3 to be made in soft steel at 14mm, which would cost £5,000 to the hull and £11,500 in total. A sketch of the vehicle, along with the name Experimental Fast Medium Tank, was used, and the suspension type, called the Japanese type, the Japan reference related to the older Vickers Medium C, which was made with aim for export to Japan, of which they then later modified into their Type 89 tank. The older A6E2 and A7E2 tanks underwent further exercises to decide which suspension offered the best ride, along with additional input from John Carden from Vickers. And despite failures from the engine blocks, the A7E2 independent trailing bogey type recorded as Japanese type again, was to be used if modified. However, on further examination, the suspension type of A7E2 had been badly damaged, and a major gatehouse, commander of the experimental board, concluded that it wouldn't be suitable for a fast tank, and they felt that the older Vickers Horseman type would be more suitable. But others argued it would require a whole new redesign, and so the modified Japanese type, with some improvements, would be used. Other improvements were also required, the new number 9 radio sets were larger, and so would require extra space, as the batteries could get off deadly gas, and were now placed inside the hull, and the turret bustle somewhat modified to account for this. The cupola was also altered, as it would now fit triple X blocks as opposed to the older periscope system found on the previous vehicles. The weapon was also changed to a 2 pounder gun, which while smaller than the 3 pounder, offered considerably better anti-armour performance and would become the mainstay gun for British tanks for the next five years. A7E3 was ready around the 8th of November 1936, and underwent firing trials at Farnborough on the 11th of May 1937. Several issues appeared. One of the engines broke, 
but the vehicle remained operational as the second kept working, which at least proved that point. Other issues included an experimental track type which had failed, and the bogies were bent badly at speed. These were easily replaced, although the aforementioned Major Gates felt vindicated in his opinion that the suspension type was not suitable for fast tanks, as he'd said, reaching its maximum absorption at values at 15 miles per hour. Despite this, the vehicle was able to reach 30 miles an hour on roads, more than the 25 miles an hour expected. Overall, the A73 was not an award-winning design. The suspension issues plagued it, and proved that it was not adequate for fast tanks, such as the new planned cruiser class, but was deemed adequate and stable for slower speeds, with good weight distribution and carrying capacity. The idea of heavy-duty diesel engines and transmission carried over into the A12 Matilda, which was also a very successful, if somewhat slow tank, and would see service until late World War II, and was known for its durability, and the suspension held out with the increased weight of armour. Lessons learnt from this were also applied to the Churchill tank, which served into the 1950s, while the turret itself and its gun would go on to form the basis for the preceding family of cruiser tanks. Overall, the A7 series left a long legacy, and the ideas and solutions that would alter the shape of British tank design, and although almost forgotten today, it remains an important vehicle in the design and development story. Well guys, I hope you like this quick ramble on the A7 series. If you did, give us a like or a subscribe. Let's help this channel grow a bit and I can keep making new vehicles. We've got lots of interesting projects coming up for you soon and we're actually going to take a break from the UK for just a little bit and go down to South America and look at some of the amazing vehicles by Ingesa. So until next time, toodle pip.